you'd like to turn in your Bibles this morning, turn to the Gospel of St. Luke. John Romero asked me earlier today, he said, well, what are you going to preach on today? And I said, uh, Christmas, April Fool's. <laughs> But I guess I'll stick to the old conventional. Luke 24, reading verses 1 through 12, it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. In Luke's account of the resurrection, he gives us what's often referred to as the empty tomb. Sort of, he has others telling us Jesus is risen, but he doesn't show Jesus. In fact, in Luke, Jesus doesn't appear until later that afternoon on the road to Emmaus as he's sharing there two men who will encounter Jesus and then later that night he will appear to the disciples and they will see him. But the first glimpse that we have of Jesus is this empty tomb and the first messengers are the women. They're the first ones who will carry the news that Jesus has arisen. And there's a group of women who had followed him who were his strong supporters. And these women had been to the tomb and seen his body. Not on this day, but on the day when Christ was crucified, he went, they went to the tomb because they were under a time pressure. Jesus died roughly at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the Jewish Sabbath was coming, and it would begin at 6 in the evening. And so they had roughly three hours there to get permission to take the body of Christ down, which was done by one of his followers, Joseph of Arimathea, and taken to a tomb that belonged to Joseph, and they would hurry the body in, and they would put a shroud over it, 
and do certain things, but they didn't have enough time to do all the normal preparations because at 6 o'clock the Sabbath would begin, and so it was necessary to go and hurry because on the Sabbath they were forbidden to do any work, so they had to be through with whatever they did, so they had to rush it to get everything done. And so they had been to the tomb, they saw where his body was, and they were there, and then they had to leave and go back to celebrate the Sabbath. They had rested on the Sabbath day. That was not a good rest. You know, sometimes you have a day off, and you enjoy it. This was not such a day. They had rested on the Sabbath, but they were struggling with their emotions. The one they had followed, the one they had believed in, was gone in their minds. They were in a hurry to get back. And so they had made an agreement among themselves, okay, the first thing on that Sunday after the Sabbath, we will meet early and we will go to the tomb and we will finish putting all the spices and putting all the other things that had to be done. (coughs) And so they had rested as much as they could on that Sabbath, but then they returned to finish their work. <coughs> a lot of times we find with these, they're caring, they're concerned, they want to help, but they don't know what's going on. They're returning thinking, okay, we've got to do this, and we've got to do this, and we've got to do this, and... The tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. There's nothing in there. The body is missing. There's an empty tomb that is there telling them something has happened. We know from other accounts, they think, They've moved his body. Someone has done something with the body. They didn't know the someone was God. They didn't know that God had been there and that the whole situation on the earth had changed. And there are two messengers there. The Bible describes them as angelic. They have shiny clothes. They're there and they speak to them. And they have three things to say to them. The first thing is they ask them a question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek this? This isn't the place where Jesus is. Almost with the thinking, you should know better. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Do I need to change mics, Sean? Yes. because I know she doesn't like to share. <laughs> so why do you seek the living among the dead? They said, he is not here. He is risen. So the first news that they hear is from the mouth of the angels that are there, he is not 
here is risen. This isn't the place to look for Jesus. The empty tomb is there. The empty tomb is still empty. There's no body there. You don't look for the living among the dead. If you're looking for someone, you don't go to a cemetery. And so the angels announce, and the third thing that they say is, the Son of Man shall rise again. He's reminding them of what a continuing message that has to be repeated many times on this first Easter Sunday. And that is, weren't you paying attention? And they're like a lot of us. No, we don't pay attention. No, we think that things are a certain way and we are not prepared when God surprises us. We're not prepared when God does something a little bit out of the ordinary. We're not prepared when all of a sudden God does exactly what he said he would do. That's been the course of human history. The children of Israel came out of Egypt having seen the power and the majesty of God. And Moses takes them to Mount Sinai and they see the thunder and the cloud and the lightning and all these strange signs and they're afraid because they have the presence of God is there. And Moses goes up for 40 days to receive instruction from God and what do they do? They go immediately into idolatry. It's like, weren't you paying attention? And again, when they go into the promised land and Moses and Joshua and their leaders told them over and over again, here is how God wants you to live. And do they do that? No. Why would we do a little thing like obey God? When we can go out here and do it our own way. And that's because our way is so good. I've talked to people at times in counseling in different situations. And they tell me what a mess their life is. And I've even asked them the question at times because I knew how they were raised. I said, well, have you considered getting right with God? And their answer was, well, that would really bring changes in my life. And I want to say, well, your life is so wonderful right now. But no, we spend most of our time not paying attention. And the disciples were the same way. They had seen the miracles of Jesus. They had heard his words. They had even heard him talking about his prophecy where he would he hinted and told them these things. He said, you know, I've got to die. And they're thinking, no, no, we don't want that. He tried to tell them how he would be similar to what happened to Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth. And he told them, but I'll rise again. They didn't think about that. All they could do was see life through their eyes, hear words through their own understanding, and they did not pay attention to everything that Jesus had said, and so they have to be reminded. There's a powerful verse in the book of James in chapter 1. James wrote it like this. He said, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And then he tells us this thing about God. 
He says, now God doesn't upbraid you. Now that's not a word that we use a whole lot now, upbraid. But we know what it's like. Let me tell you what upbraid is. Upbraid is when you've asked someone a question and they think, dummy, here's the answer, like you should know better. God doesn't upbraid us. God takes into account how ignorant we are. God takes into account how much we're not paying attention. God takes into account our frailty and that we do not keep up. And he understands us. And so he doesn't look down. And that's what we're going to see happen in all the accounts on this first Easter Sunday. The two guys on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus speaks to them, he'll start he says, what's wrong with you guys? And they'll go on and say, well, we, you know, we've had a big upset to our plans. Jesus, a prophet of God, came. And the Romans and the powers of the Jewish temple and Sanhedrin, they, they crucified him and just ruined our plans. And Jesus will take the time and He'll speak to them from the prophets and from the law and basically explain to them, well, didn't you know that this is exactly what Jesus was going to do? And they don't even know that it's Jesus talking to them. A lot of times, Jesus is talking to us and we don't realize it. A lot of times God is speaking to us and we don't realize it. Again, that's a pattern that we see all throughout Scripture. We look at Samuel and he's living in the, with the high priest of Israel and he's there and he hears a voice and he goes in there and says, Samuel, what did you want? And Samuel said, I didn't call you. And Samuel goes back and he hears the voice again and he comes back a second time. Eli, what do you want? And he said, I didn't call you. He said, but if you go back and you hear that voice again, why don't you do this? Why don't you say, yes, Lord, what do you want? And so Samuel is hearing the voice of God, and he doesn't know that he's hearing that voice. A lot of times we hear things and we read things in the Bible and then later on, all of a sudden, it'll just click in our minds like, oh, yeah, that's what God was talking about all the time. And so these angels here are reminding these women who were there. The job that you came to do doesn't need to be done anymore. The tomb is empty. There's no body here. He's among the living. And so it finally clicks with them. Wow, we've had a, a visitation with an angel. We've seen an empty tomb. We've got a message, and we'll go share it with the others. And so the first message is delivered. And again, what do we see? The Bible describes it seemed to them as idle words. Like, what are y'all talking about? And to those who don't know and to those who don't understand, I remember I was in a class once at a Presbyterian cemetery, seminary. Did I say cemetery? That seemed it. Uh, yeah. Same thing. And I remember we were studying one of the prophets in the Old Testament. And this girl, out of all sincerity, spoke up that morning. And she said, what was this guy on? Referring to, he must have had some really good drugs. The 
about half the class in there were Pentecostals, and we turned and looked at her and said, uh, you need to get saved, girl. <laughs> he was on the Holy Spirit. He was full of God's Spirit, and God was speaking to us, but sometimes when God speaks to us, we just do not understand, and just like these ladies here found out as they returned back, and they're they're speaking to the followers of Jesus. They're speaking to Peter and James and John and the others. And they said, here's what happened. The tomb is empty. There were two messengers there. They said, he's risen. And what happens? No one believes. No one believes. Some people think that we have, and there was a big teaching in the church years ago about, well, you have to believe, and then you have to name it, and you have to claim it, and then God's going to do it. Guess what? What God wants to do, he's not waiting on anybody. Here we have a great example They've heard the teaching by Jesus himself about the coming death, burial, and resurrection, and not a one of them believes. Did that stop Jesus from rising from the grave? No. Jesus was not dependent on them. God is not dependent on you. God is always waiting for us to catch up. We're never ahead of him. He's like patiently waiting because he doesn't do that upbraiding thing. Come on. I'm waiting on you. Here it is. And so the first messengers of the gospel of Salvation, it seems like idle tales and no one believes. And sometimes we can relate to that because sometimes we share with others in our family and our friends sometimes of, hey, this is what God has done for us. And they look at you like, wow, you're crazy. Where'd you come from? Where did you hear that? whether they believe or not, it's still important for you to tell the message. It's still important for you to share your testimony. It's still important for you to share and say, this is what happened. Now Luke tells us about Peter. We know from the Gospel of John that Peter didn't go by himself, but Luke only tells us about Peter. And he said how Peter went and looked for himself. Now, what it tells us is that Peter marvels at the sight. He goes in there, and what does Peter see? Peter goes in, and he sees that the tomb is empty. The stones rolled away. There were these messengers, these angels that were around earlier, but I don't see them. I don't see a body. But he sees clothes. He sees the shroud that had covered him. He sees these things. And he marvels at it. Like, wow. What is going on here? There's nothing in this text that lets us understand that Peter knew, okay, this is what happened. For Peter... 
Peter has a lot of good qualities. Peter's bold. Peter's willing to jump in there. Peter's willing to be first. Peter's willing to try when no one else is willing to try. Just as when he saw Jesus walking on water and he said, Lord, if it's really you, let me bid me to come out. And Jesus says, come on out. And Peter comes out. And then he walks for a little bit. And then in true Peter fashion, he realizes, I'm walking on water. That isn't the way it's supposed to be. And he starts to sink. Later on, even after all these events, Peter will be on a rooftop when God is preparing him to start preaching to the Gentiles and God will give him a vision and ask him, a, give him a command, rise and eat all the animals. And Peter think, okay, this is a test of my faith and God's, and the right answer is, no, I will not eat these animals because nothing common and unclean has ever passed my lips. And so three times God gives him the vision. Three times Peter responds with the wrong answer. Peter is not quick on the uptake. And again here, there's nothing here that says Peter realizes, oh yeah, this is exactly what happened. But he sees it for himself. He marvels at what he sees. He's trying to figure it out. And he's waiting on someone else to explain it. It probably won't click for Peter until later that night when he actually sees Jesus. Went, oh. This is what happened. And Jesus is probably saying, yes, Peter. Been trying to tell you that all day, but yes, that's what happened. When we look at this, and the reason that Easter is so important, is because this event is the foundation of our faith. It is the central core belief of Christianity. There is nothing else as important as this event. We revere the Bible. The Bible is very important. We say it's the word of God. But the church was around for about 300 years before the Bible was completely finished in the form that we have it today. Well, what did they do? How did they build the church then? They built it on the simple fact of what the angels were trying to get across and what Jesus was trying to get across to his followers. And that was that the most important reason that we worship Jesus Christ as the Son of God is because Jesus told his followers, kill me, bury this body, and in three days I will rise again. Now you may not understand all the intricacies of Christian doctrine and faith and belief, you may not understand all the mysteries that are there in the Bible, but this is one thing that you must understand. Jesus said he would rise again, and he did it. Paul said that is more important than anything else. He did it. And as long as I know that he did it, then... Who am I putting faith in? That guy. Why? He rose from the dead. Why am I going to pay attention to the Bible and what the Bible says? Because Jesus took the Bible seriously. Therefore, I take the Bible seriously. Why? Because 
Jesus rose from the dead. And what's important to him is important to me. Why do I live the Christian life? Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he said, and he conquered death. If he conquered death, I have a feeling he's got a handle on life. He talked to Nicodemus, and he said, you must be born again. So, therefore, I know that for all of us, we must all be born again. Why? Because Jesus said to do it. And why don't we pay attention to Jesus? Because he died, and he was buried, and he rose from the dead. Sounds like he knows what he's talking about. So therefore, we pay attention to his teachings. We pay attention to his commands. We pay attention to what he has to say. Because he conquered death. He conquered it. And so as again, we celebrate this Easter Sunday. And we renew our faith. And we're reminded, as those first believers were reminded, that yes, Jesus did exactly what he said he was going to do. And therefore, if he did that, then when he speaks to your heart, then my heart, and he says, this is what I'm going to do for you, we can believe him. When he says to us, when we're in the depths of sin, I will save you, I will transform your life, we can believe him. If he has the power over death, then certainly he has power over sin. And so we believe. And I remind us again today that this is the foundation of our faith. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. And it has been empty ever since. Because he is alive. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have given to us. Lord, I just want to pray for anyone here under the sound of my voice. Who is concerned about their relationship with you that they would realize that you love them and that you care for them, that you're patient with them. And God, I pray that this would be the time when they would say in their hearts, I believe, I believe, I believe. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the blessings that you've given to us in this life. Not because we're worthy, but because Jesus is alive. Let's all stand, please. As you know, we allow you to text questions in during the message. And first question, did Jesus speak to Mary after the resurrection? I am assuming this is Mary, his mother. And because the Bible's full of Mary's. We know he definitely spoke to Mary Magdalene uh, because she was later on there after Peter had left the tomb. Mary was still hanging around and Jesus spoke to her. There's no written record that he spoke to Mary, but there's a lot that is unsaid. It's like, what all did Jesus do after he rose from the dead? A lot of it is a mystery. I sort of have a feeling, we know that he appeared to different people, and I sort of have a feeling that one of the first ones on that list might have been Mary, but we have no record of it, but that's how I fill in the blank anyway. <laughs> okay. Why didn't they recognize Jesus after he rose? Fascinating question. Number one, 
we know his appearance is different and yet the same. We know that he'll tell Thomas a week later, here are the scars. Put your hand on them to see for yourself. But we know on several occasions, Mary Magdalene doesn't recognize Jesus. She thinks he's the gardener. The two guys that are on the road to Emmaus will travel several, seven miles walking with him, talking with him, before they finally realize who it is they're talking to. So it would appear that there is some supernatural power going on here where not everybody immediately recognizes who Jesus is. Exactly how God did this, we're not told. But we know that it happened. Okay. When the shroud was found, was it found folded and why? Uh, there are different theories on that. There were two things that would have been there. There would have been the shroud and it was not folded. It was, and John talks about this, it would almost appear the way John describes there, and the language is much more specific. The shroud would have looked like the body was there, and then the body disappeared, and then it just sort of fell, but it still had a little bit of shape of an empty body, like Jesus came through the shroud. It wasn't something that he didn't have to deal with, but then they would have had a napkin over his face, a cloth. And John says that it was folded. So the shroud was unfolded other than its original fold over the body. And the napkin was folded that would have been around his face. So that's what we know. Why is Good Friday called Good if he died on Friday? Why is it Easter on Monday? Now, multiple questions here. I'll try to answer them all. Uh, it's called Good Friday, and the best explanation I've heard is, what would you call a day if you were scheduled for execution and someone took your place? Good Friday, yes. And that's why it's called Good Friday, because Jesus took the place of all of ours, because he did not deserve death, but he died for us. And then some people, and it's always a common thing there because there are three days. How do you get three days if he dies on Friday and he rose on Sunday? And that's because there are three days that are involved. There is Friday when he traditionally he died, and then you have the Sabbath, which would have started 6 o'clock on Friday evening, and then he rises sometime on Sunday morning, so you have... Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but not three full and complete days. And people like to argue about that back and forth. I choose not to. <laughs> is salvation as easy as remember me as the thief on the cross said to Jesus, or is the sinner's prayer the thing to say? What's important is not what you say or how you say it. What's important is what's going on in your heart. Paul would say it like this, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, the same shall be saved. What's important to believe? What's important to believe is just simply, I'm a sinner, I need salvation, and Jesus is my only hope. And I believe that Jesus saves me. Whatever combination of words you get that message out, whether it's a sinner's prayer or whether it's is the thief on the cross. you got to understand about when they said stuff on the cross. Those words are few and far between because they can't breathe on the cross. That's what's so excruciating about that death. When you're hanging in a downward position, the muscles around your chest are so constricted that you cannot breathe. So in order to breathe or order to say something, you must pull yourself literally up against the nails, if you can imagine how painful that is, in order to breathe and in order to speak. So when he says, remember me, it took great effort just to say those two words. 
Okay. Um, Again, thank you so much for being here and sharing today with us. And I tr hope that all of you were blessed in some way.